How should you price your work? Are you too high, too low? Join me today as I have a very, very special guest on creator tips, tools, and tales. We're going to talk all about pricing your work with Chris Doe. Let's start the countdown. Welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you're tuning in from. Welcome to my live show. My name is Fanny Dunnigan and every other Thursday I come to you to share creator tips, tools and tales. And we have a very, very special guest this week that's going to be talking about a topic that often people don't share their advice and insights on. It's going to be all around pricing your work. So make sure you watch for the whole hour because you're going to want to get your notebook, get your pen, and jot down every little tip and a piece of advice that this guest is going to be sharing. But in the meantime, let's see who is in the audience. We have Jennifer tuning in from New York, Brooklyn. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for tuning in. Let us know where you all are tuning in from. Make sure you introduce yourself. Tell people what you do. Make the comments of the feed a networking platform for you to meet other people, introduce yourselves, and I challenge you to connect with at least three new people today to broaden your network and build community. And uh, you never know who you're going to meet. A lot of folks that I've met in the comments become collaborators, partners, potential clients, and friends. So it's a wonderful community that's here. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you introduce yourselves and tell each other what you do and connect with each other. Uh, feel free to network. Awesome. So... I want to jump straight into it because I want to get straight to the guest. But first, I want to welcome my community manager, Anne Small. Welcome, Anne. How's Hello. it going? 
Hello, everybody. How excited are we to have Christo here today? Like, right? This Look is the best topic ever, Fanny. Blowing up. Yes. Right. So. Um, so Anne is going to make sure we don't miss any of your important questions. Make sure you jot down your question and have them ready during the show. And Anne is actually going to be picking the best question that gets asked during the show. And we'll have a prize at the end for that person. But you have to tune in all the way till the end of the show. So make sure you do that. So thank you, Anne. Thanks for keeping us honest and on top of things. See you there. Okay. Uh, and then you'll also see Rebecca in the comments. She'll be helping out as well. She's my marketing assistant. So be sure to connect with her as well and say hi. Okay. So like I do every week, I have a content tip of the week for you. It's super short today, but super important. Also, this is something that's often neglected. People don't even think about it, but it is so important. And it is so critical to um, when you show up on video, and especially live shows or podcasts. So let's get to the content tip of the week. Okay, so um, as every week, I have show notes for you. So make sure you go to this link and we'll be posting that in the comments. It will have my content tip of the week as well as a place for you to jot down your notes from the show as well as next week's uh, or in two weeks, the guests that I'm going to have. And uh, this week, I'm going to talk all about your way of being when it comes to showing up on video and on live events. So what do I mean by that? So very often we focus on what to say, what to do, um, the equipment and all these logistics and tactics when we show up on video and live shows. But what we forget to do is our way of being. And it might sound cheesy, but it is so important how you show up and the way you are and whether you're grounded or not. So before every show, and I suggest for you, before any kind of video that you hop on, I have three things for you to do right before you go live or before a video. Number one, I want you to close your eyes. Number two, I want you to take three deep breaths and ground yourself. And number three, I want you to answer this question and say it out loud and ask yourself, what experience do I want to create for my audience today? So what does that look like for this show? The experience that I want to create for you is to create a sense of community and support and encouragement and empowerment. I want to create a sense of togetherness. I want everyone to support each other and encourage each other so that we may all learn from our guests and lift ourselves up as well as grow our businesses together. And so that's how I want to show up for you. And I hope you'll show up like that for, your, um, for each other as well. And it's a great way to just kind of like level set your way of being and then that way, everything that comes out of your mouth will come from that place of value and support for each other. Okay? So when, when you're trying to ground yourself, just ask yourself, what experience do I want to create for my audience? And that's my content tip of the week. Okay, let's get to the meat of the show. Everyone, I want you all to join me in welcoming Christo the founder of the future. Chris, how are you? Hi, Fanny. I'm doing really well. I was pumped up with that intro, and now I feel very grounded. I was closing my eyes Ooh. when you were walking us through that. There you go. Yes, I saw you bopping your head. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we took you to the energy and then grounding. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me. I want to just 
read to people real quick your LinkedIn profile, Ashley, and then I want you to expand on that from there. Okay. So you ran a two-time Emmy Award-winning motion design brand consultancy for over 23 years. And in 2014, a friend encouraged you to take educational, to make educational videos on YouTube. You reluctantly agreed, and the decision changed your life and your business. Now through the future, you speak, you teach creatives how to speak the language of art and business. And if anybody follows you on YouTube, they know you have over 1.93 million followers. And on LinkedIn, you have over 300,000 followers. Bravo. Bravo. It's no easy feat. Um, but I know it's because of all the great value. But how did you get there? How did you go from agency to YouTube guru, advisor? <laughs> Tell us. Well, yeah, thank you, Fanny. Uh, that that was definitely not within the plan. And sometimes we make too much of having a clearly laid out plan that we're not open to opportunities. And sometimes those opportunities look like obstacles and challenges. The, the big transition happened for me when I noticed that our industry, the motion design industry, wasn't growing and expanding in the way that it had. And so I can see the trend lines and the trend lines weren't moving in a positive direction. So I was in search of another way to apply my talents. And my business coach at that time, his name is Kier McLaren, wonderful man. He had told me before, the labels in which we use to describe ourselves oftentimes make it easy for people to understand who we are, but they're also containers for where we see ourselves. And so for a long time, I thought I was a director, a, a designer, a creative director, a motion artist. And I didn't look at myself as an educator that could have the potential of reaching so many different people. So it was two things that happened in my life. We'll call them the two J's. The first J is my wife. Her name is Jessie. And she is a designer, a very creative human being. And every once in a while, she would come to class with me when I was teaching at Art Center. And it was a great time for us because she got to see me in my most happy, joyous, abundant state. I was giving all of myself to my students and I loved every minute of it. And she had asked me this question on the ride home one day. She had asked is this how you see yourself? Do you see yourself reaching more people? Do you ever get tired of giving the same lecture, the same workshop, doing the same thing over and over again? Isn't there so much more for you? And I know she didn't mean it as a crit criticism, but I felt it. I felt like, gosh, uh, you're saying this is not good enough. And she was pushing me to go outside my comfort zone. And unfortunately for me, I didn't know what the answer was. I'm like, yes, I agree with you conceptually, but it's like you created a problem in need of a solution. The The second J comes into my story, and his name is Jose Cavier. And he's a fellow Arts Center grad. And he had reached out to me and said, you know, I think I've always seen you trying to do this teaching thing. Why don't we join forces and start teaching together? And I'm, I'm like, okay, let's do that. I love that. He says, so here's the thing. We both have to make content together. You have power that you have not yet surfaced. And I'm going to tap into that brain and that cre creativity of yours. And I told Jose at that time, because I'm the kind of person who is a behind the camera talent, not in front of camera talent. So I don't want to do this. I have too much to risk, too much to lose. No one will care. And I'm liable to say things that are going to come back to haunt me in the future. And Jose made me one of the most generous offers that anybody's ever made me. He said, look, here's the thing. I'll do all the talking. You just sit there until you're ready to speak. Just stay silent. So he basically gave me no excuse to get out of this. So that's when I'm like, okay. And the decision to say yes in that moment when everything looked like an obstacle was the catalyst for changing the entire trajectory of my life and my career. And eight years later, over 1,300 videos later, uh, here we are. <laughs> I have to post this comment because it just... <laughs> Okay, what's the comment? <laughs> right here. Levent, Chris sells better than <laughs> sex nowadays. That's kind of hard to do. I have to, do. I have to say. Um, thank you, I think. Yeah. I also saw a comment, but I can't find it. They are admiring your hat. Your hat says, God is a designer. What do you mean by that? Well, there's a story behind the hat. I was raised Catholic. I'm not a practicing Catholic anymore. 
a friend of mine, a born again Christian, his name is Angel Acevedo, and he has this company. He's been working on this concept for 10 years. And he said, Chris, can I send you that? Will you wear it? And I said, Angel, I can make no promises. Let me see it. If I like it, I'll wear it. If I don't, then that'll be that. And of course, it comes in the mail and I see it. It's flush right, rag left. It's set in Helvetica. It's beautifully typeset. The word designer is here. It's thought provoking. So I said, I will wear it. And it's part of my uniform now. And the thing that people get upset at me, people get upset at me from both sides. Religious people say you shouldn't use the word God and is he a designer or is she a designer? Um, and there's all kinds of uh, debates I might get into. And then there are atheists on the other side, like, is there God? So my whole thing is, let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm a very socially awkward introvert. So I will wear things, statement pieces to provoke people to have a conversation with me. It okay. takes a lot of the pressure off of me to figure out what to say to them. I do want to do a shout out to your topography and design work. That's not the topic of today, but mm -hmm. it's absolutely beautiful. For those of you out there, go to his website. Uh, it was thefuture.com. Is that right? With That's right. No the e. future. No E at the end. And um, we'll post it in the link, thefuture.com with no E. And uh, it's, it's one of the most beautifully aesthetically pleasing website just the colors the topography anyways shout out to that um i do want to call out real quick your linkedin profile headline says loud introvert with a big mission right and mm -hmm. a lot of times when i work with people they say oh i can't create content i'm an introvert um i'm not meant to to speak up that much. I can't get on video. What would you say to that? I said, well, welcome to the party, friend. Welcome to the party. <laughs> Extroverts, introverts, ambiverts, verts of all stripes and colors don't feel natural in front of the camera. It's a very unusual thing to speak to a machine. And when you're talking to yourself, one might describe that as a form of psychosis. So we, mm -hmm. we need to understand we're all in the same boat together. And here's where the main differences are. As an introvert, um, it's I, I lose energy when I'm around lots of people, especially people I don't know. Of course, when I'm around family, it's a whole different situation. Yes. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to figure out how we can communicate and scale our message. So here's the thing, and, I, and we're going to get into pricing, scaling, and building value for yourself in, in just one second. Okay. So when I did design services, I essentially sold a little bit of my thinking, but mostly I sold my time for money. And so yes. when I wasn't working, I wasn't making money. And it was a dream. It's a dream of all creative people that wouldn't it be great if that one asset that you built, that one video, that one logo that you made gave you residual income. And I know of a few, like less than a handful of people who've been able to license their creative work that actually made real money for them days, months, and years later on. So that's the, the true dilemma. And we have to think about it like this. If one day something happens to your eyes, to your hands, to your ability mm -hmm. to think, or you uh, become um, you so ill that you can't work anymore, your earning potential ceases and the people who depend on you, your family, your friends, your community, uh, they're deprived of your support. And this is something we all should think about. But here's the thing. We have this thing called ideas. And in the legal sense, it's called intellectual property. And if you're able to package and distribute and monetize your intellectual property, you can quite figuratively clone yourself mm. and to be able to multiply your efforts and then work beyond your ability to touch something and to craft something. The, the classic model is this. We're all familiar with this already. One is an author writes a book. It could be a work of fiction or nonfiction. And we've captured ideas in our thinking. And now we've processed it in a way that other people can experience this yes. without us having to be there. Mm. Right? That's number one. Number two, you take that same story and you perform it on stage or it's somehow recorded. And people can watch facsimiles of that performance over time and you're able to scale your IP there too. This is really critical if you want to increase your potential net worth and your value. I'll pause there. Awesome. Scale with your intellectual IP. Love it. Intellectual property. Well, let's 
let's rewind a little bit. So let's talk then first about struggles, right? Let's start with our pain, right? The pain of pricing, the struggles with pricing, Okay, right? Why do you think we struggle so much with pricing? Um, I, I, you know, honestly, I first came across you because I saw a role play that you did on YouTube with one of your students. And it was the, the quintessential client creative client consultant conversation of that's too much. I can't afford it. And then it goes from there and you did a whole role play with it. Right. And we all have struggled with pricing. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from many places, Fanny, as far as I can tell. Um, one is in, in most societies, talking about money is considered impolite. We're not supposed to talk about money. We're not supposed to talk about how much money we made, how much money we lost, um, how much money we have saved up. It's it's a sign of like bad manners in many cases, because especially when you're doing well, it can sound like you're being braggadocious. So now we have a culture already around putting t taboo around people talk about money. Think about the last time you you heard somebody speak openly about how much money they made, what kind of bonus they got. What was your impression of them? Was it neutral? Was it positive or was it negative? And so we think negatively of other people who speak about money, good or bad. Yes. Then we're less likely to talk about money ourselves. And it makes us afraid to talk about money to talk about money with our family, with our friends, and now especially with clients who have some power over us. The next challenge is there's a lack of confidence. Like, am I worth this much? And we're going to go back to this idea of labor and hours, and we're going to attach that to ideas of worth and money. Yes. And so we have to start to understand that. And the third reason why I think we're so uncomfortable talking about money is because we're just not taught how to. We can learn language, we can learn how to draw, but very rarely are you going to get someone who's been in business, who yes. has practical experience dealing with money, client negotiations, and has been successful to be able to take time out of their very busy day to come and talk to us in ways that we can understand. We know that there are millionaires and billionaires out there who uh, uh, create seminars and workshops for other millionaires and billionaires. But when we're looking at like, oh, I'm just artist, I can't relate to you the language in which you speak and the kinds of clients that you're talking about, I just can't relate. And so there's this divide between where we are and where we want to be. And it's my endeavor to at least close that gap a little bit. Absolutely. And we're not talking about those people on YouTube that promise to help you make six figures and seven figures in, in one month. With no we're skills, talking, no money down, no skills. without barely working, uh, living the nomadic exactly. lifestyle. We're not talking about those people. Exactly. Yes, yes. So much of, I think, our, and even for me, as I started out as an entrepreneur, m my self-worth, I thought, was tied up into pricing. And there's this huge hurdle to overcome sometimes to get to that. Um, but what are some of the common mistakes that you people, you see people make when it comes to pricing their work? And you deal with creatives. I deal a lot with coaches and consultants, right? Um, where do you see the mistakes being made when it comes to people pricing their work? The first one will be semi-obvious, but one that people commit all the time. Our reluctance to talk about money means we wait to the very end to talk about money, which then builds up this tension within you and the prospect that you're talking to. Because as much as I love whatever it is that you're making, the product or service, I start to cringe a little bit like, oh my gosh, when the price comes, am I going to be able to afford this? And we're all holding our collective breath and 30 minutes go by, 45 minutes go by. And I start to wonder, am I going to get cheated in this operation? Because I'm spending too much time. I'm feeling I'm making a greater commitment of time. Therefore, my ability to say no at that point is going to be diminished. And so this is something that we have to really think about. So waiting to talk about the price yes. is a mistake that a lot of people make. In every I've other, done that. <laughs> we all have done that. Yes. That's why we know yes. this, right? Or we in don't every... even talk about it. And then we send the proposal later. And then they're oh, that's like, even worse, too expensive. Because we're, we're at the end of the conversation. It's going to feel really awkward now. And, and they say, do you have any other questions? And we say, I'll send you a proposal. 
And then we go back to our machine and then we sit there and just push numbers around and around and around and lose all sense of context and relevancy to the client. Yes. And we submit something and what, inevitably what happens is people get sticker shock. Yes. Um, they didn't get a good feeling from the initial call or they just ghost on you and they never even call you back because that's the easiest way to say no is not even to call you back. And we've all experienced something like that. And there's a much better way. Uh, number two of the less obvious of the two mistakes that I can think of right off the top of my head is we make the money conversation, the value conversation all about us and not about the client. And you're going to sit there and say, no, I don't do that, Chris. And I would like to submit for your consideration exhibit A, which is when you think about price, what are you thinking about? Generally, people are thinking about their time and the value of their time and how long it's going to take them to make something. Because it's so commonly associated with value, with labor, labor and time, right? So if I make it all about me, this has no context to the prospect, my client. And so if we were to change this and ask them, what problem are you trying to solve? What would it mean for you to solve this problem? And what would it mean if this problem persisted three, six, nine months from now? What would that do to you? And then we get to an understanding that the client then gets to determine what's fair to them and how big the problem is to them. So here's an example. And I got this from Jonathan Stark, who, who wrote a book called Hourly Billing is Nuts. I believe that's the title of his book. He, he wrote in, in an email that he sent out. He said, I have a son. He plays video games. And in the video games, you can buy skins. And the skins cost real money, money like cash that you pay for that has no intrinsic or I'm sorry no extrinsic value within the game it doesn't help you to move faster it doesn't increase your shield or anything like that it's purely aesthetic and he's scratching his head because his son's asking him for money so he can buy this skin so he Jonathan is like this has zero value to me this is ridiculous but to his son it has all the kind of value because he wants to spend this money because it makes him feel better it makes his digital avatar feel more closely related to him so this is an example that value is completely relative. So if I were the maker of these skins and I just thought about myself and how long it took me, I might charge 15 cents. But the value to Jonathan is zero and the value to his son is several dollars. And so it's an example there of how we often misconstrue what it means to price. We don't price what we do. We price the impact, the results that we achieve for our clients. And those results will be different for each client. <sighs> We have a question from the audience All right. about Angel asks from YouTube, how would you talk about money and value with an individual or business that is from a different culture? I mean, to, to your point about we have these value conversations, especially overseas, but if we're unfamiliar with nuances and cultural differences, any tips around that? Yeah. This is a very common misconception, I think, and I'm willing to be challenged, Fanny. So if you feel it's different or Angel says, no, it's different, let's have a conversation about it. As long as the other person is a human being, then human beings operate under similar principles. Now, the nuance, the language, the cadence, and the flow may be different, but every human who calls you, who reaches out to you, has already made a couple of decisions. One, they have a problem that needs solving. Two, only by spending money will that problem go away. And three, you are considered a potential one of possible many solutions. And this is really important to understand. So they already know they have a problem. They also know that they have to spend money to make the problem go away and that they're considering you. Otherwise, they would not be reaching out to you. No right-minded business person, entrepreneur, human being wants to just sit around and chat with random people that they don't believe can solve the problem. So something in your website, in your in your social media posts or referral that they got says to them, this person is worth me giving up this non-renewable resource that I have, which is called time. So I don't easily give that time away to people. So they've already made some decisions there. So if you focus the conversation around the person in front of you, your prospect, what is a big problem you're trying to solve? Why is this problem important to you? What have you done in the past that hasn't worked out? What is the closest you've come? And what would it mean to your life and to your business, both personally and professionally, for you to make this problem go away? What would this free you up to do? And by not getting this thing done, what opportunity costs are in play? And this will work 
whether you're in China, in Latin America, in Brazil, in India, in America, Canada, or some part of Europe, because that's a human being who has a real problem. Pain points are universal, and we all are looking for solutions to our problems, right? I think so. We are. Yeah. <laughs> Unless we want to wallow in our misery. <laughs> some people like that. They do, because it's comfortable or familiar. <laughs> so then their problem will be, how do I experience more pain? Everybody has a problem they want to solve. Hence, we attract more drama. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. In week three, we'll cover that. Uh, Brandon from LinkedIn says, Chris, in the past, you have said to know your client when pricing. For example, if your client for a logo is a sandwich shop, you charge for a sandwich. Do you know that these client? Do you know that those clients, even if that payment is a sandwich, is it still worth doing? Okay, so, uh, it's, it's an exchange of like services in a way versus paying for something. Is that what? Yeah. Um, well, it, it depends. I never use this exact example. I, there must be a joke <laughs> about sandwiches because my former uh, co-host uh, would talk about sandwiches all the time. Got it. And so what we need to understand is what is it we're doing, what kind of impact that we're creating, and how important is it to this person. So generally, where we as creative people who sell services to others, we get caught up in a trap. A person who, say, owns a local business, a mom-and-pop operation who makes delicious sandwiches but has one location and does about $2 million of revenue a year. They wake up one day and say, you know what, um, I need a new logo. And so they reach out to you and say, hey, how much is it for you to make a logo for me? And so we default to the, well, it's going to take me 10, 10 days or a 10 hours and I charge 400. So it's going to be $3,500. And in your mind, you're like, that's a super fair price. That's a really bargain price and I'm being price sensitive to you. Obviously, I'd charge you more if you're Microsoft. But then the sandwich shop owner looks at that price and says, what can I buy in my life that I really need? That would cost $3,500. Maybe there's a new toaster oven or uh, some some new thing, a, a new meat slicer or, or uh, buy more organic vegetables and they think that can improve their product. So the sandwich shop owner has determined the logo isn't worth much to them and then they start to haggle you. They start to beat you down and say, is it really that hard? Isn't it like you just typing in a typeface and a font and I can just get that and you know, can't you just do this in Mac Paint and give me a pixel file or something? So they see all kinds of things because they're confused. Well, the problem began from the very moment in which they reach out to you, which is they thought they had a problem that they wanted money to spend money to solve. And it turns out they don't want to solve this problem. So what you cannot do is you cannot convince somebody that a non-problem is a much bigger problem to them. And then they should spend a lot of money. Now, you may be a very gifted salesperson and temporarily manipulate them into believing that a new logo is their best option. But after they spend that money or after the project gets underway, they're going to have buyer's remorse and they're going to blame you for this feeling that they have this negative feeling. So whenever a client comes to you, a prospect, I should say, comes to you and says, I have a problem. I'd like to spend money to solve it. You have to ask them, is this a big and important problem for you? Because without it being a big and important problem, I already know they're not going to spend a lot of money. The size of the budget or the value of the project is relative to the size of the problem as it relates to your client and not to, to you. So you might think websites are the most important thing for all businesses, but if your client doesn't believe that, good luck trying to convince them. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, if this sandwich shop owner owned 20 franchises, 20 franchises, has locations throughout town, is doing $50 million in revenue, and has now decided they need a logo, the problem that they're bringing to you, even though it sounds the same as the first sandwich shop owner, is drastically different because now one decision impacts 20 locations in the printing budget alongside the throwing out the old packaging and retraining the team about what this looks like. And we all know this, as soon as you change one piece of your identity, it ripples across so many different touch points. Signage has to go down, menus, the, the ones that are uh, plastered to the wall, the ones that they print out, the digital menu that exists online, uh, the Yelp logo and all their social media avatars have to change because they made this one decision. So now you can see to the business owner, changing this one little thing has great implications across all of their businesses, plural. And this is why you as a logo designer, even if it would only take you 10, 
days to design a logo for the single location shop or the 20 franchise location shop is the same. The, the value to the person is drastically different. Yes. I'm almost out of breath. I'll take a pause here. Did that make sense, Fanny? Yes. And I think it'll, I, I want to dive into that even further by quoting from your book, because I think the way you broke it down was, first of all, super succinct. Um, and first of all, everyone out there, by the way, this you have, oh, I think it's backwards. Well, it's called Pocket Full of Dough. Okay. This is Chris Doe's book. And in it, there's a whole section on pricing. And there is a section in there about selling inputs versus outputs versus value. And from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, inputs is when you charge hourly versus outputs when you charge by the deliverable versus value when you're creating value in, in that case, you know, in your sandwich shop um, illustration there. So you want to give you me an like, example of how that works? Yes. If you could yes. kind of illustrate each of those a little bit and then like just why some work and why some don't. Sure. I, I have to quickly mention that that phrasing of inputs and outputs and and then value is something I learned from talking to Blair Enns and from his book, Pricing Creativity. So if you want a deeper dive, pick up the book, Pricing Creativity. So let's just make this really simple. Let's go back to the sandwich shop. Maybe we'll make people hungry talking about sandwiches all the time. So when we talk about pricing based on inputs, basically everything that you put into this, uh, your time, materials, you would charge for that. So if you spent 10 hours or 10 days or 10 months, whatever you spent making it, you would charge the client for. Uh, why, why do people do this? Well, one is it's low risk for you and because you can't underbid the job. If it takes you a really long time, you're going to be protected. And so whatever it costs to make, quote unquote, then the clients are going to pay for that. However, the client has to deal with a certain amount of uncertainty. There's no guarantees on when it's gonna be delivered or even the price. And so it could be a few hundred dollars or it could be tens of thousands of dollars. And that kind of um, insecurity around uh, price certainty is going to make them feel unease, uneasy. So they're gonna say eventually to you, well, Chris, I don't really care how long it takes you to make my logo for my sandwich shop. I know the value to me here's what I need from you. I need a logo and I need four application design menus, bags and website and social media. If you can give me those deliverables, I will pay you a certain amount of money with, the, with the implication that you're allowed to guesstimate how long it's going to take you. And that most likely you're going to guess on the high side and you need to, to protect yourself from rounds of revisions or unforeseen circumstances. So you pad the budget a little bit. And what is fair to pad? It could be anywhere between 15 to 80% of padding. Uh, when I ran a service design company, it would not be um, unusual for us to charge three to four times as much as what we thought it would cost us to make. And oftentimes, project overruns, delays, um, missed deadlines, whatever it is from the client in terms of feedback, it would eat into that. And thank goodness we had enough in the budget to cover for all that. So one sign of someone who has low business acumen is to bid a fixed fee for output, the things that you deliver, and then have to come back to the client and ask for more money because it's obvious to them at that point, this is most likely your first rodeo, meaning you've not done this many times before. You didn't anticipate that these things were going to happen. Okay, the last one, the trickiest one, and we would uh, often refer to this as the holy grail of pricing, which is the price based on value. And okay, what is value? the results that you achieve for your prospect. This is really important. And so something we haven't covered yet. So in your conversation with the sandwich owner who owns 20 locations, 20 franchises, or uh, and, and they say, well, I need a new logo, your conversation would, might sound something like this. Why do you need a new logo? What impact do you want it to have on your business? Well, so here's the thing. We plan to roll out 80 more stores across the United States. That's going to give us a total of 180 storefronts. The footprint is going to increase 4X. And we want to make sure we have a really good logo because I don't want to have this conversation again in six months time when we're dealing with legal issues because it wasn't cleared or someone says that there's something phallic or inappropriate inside the logo and we hadn't considered it. And plus, we just don't want to get this thing wrong. 
okay, so it means something to your business. Then they're like, yes. And so you can talk about the impact about uh, either in revenue generated or lost opportunity protected. You know, you're protecting them from uh, not getting, um, l- launching these other 80 or 60 restaurants or 80 restaurants across the United States. And so then we talk about the impact. So now it has nothing to do with our time. Has nothing to do with the inputs. It has nothing to do with the outputs. It doesn't really matter how many deliverables you need. It's about a result that you want to achieve. Somewhere between one percent and one hundred percent, or ninety-nine percent of value created could be considered fair. Wow. And I also, I mean, diving in just real quick into this concept of a logo, right? Like further expanding on that. There's been times when I will judge a restaurant or a shop purely based on the look and feel of the the building, their decor, their logo. And so in a way, I look at that at a cursory level and then I judge it and then I decide, am I going to walk in there and buy from them? So I guess that's that in itself is value, isn't it? It is. And you know why that you do that, Fanny? Because you're a design snob. (laughs) No, because you're a snob. No, I'm just kidding. It's because we eat with our eyes and we eat with our mind, not just with our mouth. That and and my wife says this. We can have an excellent meal, but she needs ambiance. She needs to feel something. And so when you sit down and you you have nice tablecloths, a nice tablecloth and nice um, cloth napkins, and everything's in its place and the lighting is beautiful and you look amazing, and people carry themselves a certain way. They're not just walking in with shorts and flip flops smelling like um, sunblock. And and right. there's, there's a, a vibe that you get the core and it looks substantive. So we already anticipate the meal. We read the description uh, of the food that we're going to order. And you notice this, the difference between a cheap and an expensive restaurant is how they describe what you're going to eat <laughs> just with words, because the words we're tasting the food in our mind before a single piece of vegetable hits our lips or our tongue. So we're, we taste these things that when we hold uh, um, a certain glass, when they're pouring us an expensive beverage, the glass communicates to us, to our hands and then to our eyes and to, then to our lips, this is going to be a delicious beverage and it was worth whatever you paid for it. So there's ceremony and tradition that we buy into. And that's why uh, when we go to a fast food restaurant, it looks the way it does because we anticipate it to go fast and we, ex- we expect a certain amount of value, like low price, relative to the calories we can consume. And so this is why it's important. And this is what many people would call user experience design. Mm. So everything from you seeing the restaurant from a website on Yelp, to the photographs of the food, to you within 20 feet of the door and going in. Here's other things that happen too. You ever notice when you're wanting to go and impress some of your friends who are coming out of town and you hit that super popular restaurant that everybody's buzzing about? Yes. And so the buzz, the social proof that exists for that restaurant creates anticipation, desire that this is worthwhile. You could at least say to your friends and to yourself, if it's a bad meal, at least I wasn't the only one because 200 other people have raved about this being the best fill in the blank. And when you arrive, what happens, right? Do you have a reservation? And there's a line at the door. Well, it's a 45 minute wait. You're like, fine. Text me when you're ready. And once you get in, what do you see? Empty tables because it's building anticipation for you because nothing brings more people in than a line at the door. And so people who create experiences understand this about human nature, how we process things and our cognitive bias. And they know how to tap into that to create the optimal experience. And changing a few of these variables for the better can drastically improve and impact the bottom line for your client. And that's value. That's That's 100% value. (laughs) Right there, folks. (laughs) It's like when I watch Chef's Table. Do you watch? Have you seen that documentary? Yes, I have. It's brilliantly shot and produced. There's a formula for how they produce these things, and they're just genius. It is. It is. All of you Netflix chef's table. It'll make you want to go visit this, all these restaurants and save all your money and, and, and go pay three, $400 for a meal. 
But uh, let me get to some of the questions because we have some really good questions. Lori from LinkedIn says, do you advocate for li listing package pricing on your website? Okay. You can in include package pricing generally when you know your clients keep calling you and balking at your number. It means that for whatever reason, how you're being found by your prospects, it's not communicating them to you high or to them high price. So it should be your job to design because it's fairly inexpensive, your website to write your copy, to produce high quality visuals of the things that you do to communicate to the client. This is a premium experience with a luxury price attached to it. So they don't even dare to call you when they don't have a budget. So the funny thing is when I ran my service design company, clients, some smaller clients would call and say, I'm not sure I can afford you, but I'm so intrigued by the work that you do. I already know then the website and everything we've done to get them to call us has worked because I want them to know we're going to be probably the most expensive options they're going to talk to. And we create that just like how Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Prada create that experience for you before you even look at the price tag, you already know it's going to be expensive and you accept that it's going to be expensive. So in a case like that, what I would recommend is putting on your website somewhere, prices start at 10,000, 30,000, 40,000, whatever the amount is for you, you just put it on there. It's not saying that's what you charge. That's where prices start. You do this so that people can be self-selecting so they know they should not be walking into the Lamborghini dealership when they have a Hyundai budget. <laughs> There's a quote from your book. By the way, where can people get their quote, uh, your book? Because the, it's blowing up in the comments. They, okay. they want to know where they can buy your book. They can buy it directly from us. I'm going to type it in the personal chat here. And then maybe Anne can share that for me since yes. I can't drop it in there. Okay. Anne or Rebecca, if you could copy that over to the comments. Um, there's a quote in here, think like Gucci, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what you're saying, right? Think like Gucci. Yeah, because so many people would ask me this question, Chris, um, what do I have to do? How do I adjust my prices because my, my customers, my clients won't pay that much? I said, if you think like Gucci, what Gucci does is they set their price and then they find customers who can afford them, not the other way around. So don't find customers who can't afford you and then adjust your price. Do the opposite. Say that again. That's really important. One more okay. time for the audience. Please. Yes. What I want you to do is to envision the ideal client type that you'd like to work with. In the industry, people would call this like a customer profile or an avatar, uh, somebody you dream about working with. It could be an industry. It could be a certain type of work that you want to do. And just start to uh, visualize that in your mind. This is who I want to work with, right? And then find that customer based on the kind of quality of the work that you want to do. And don't go the opposite, which is a customer walks in the door, says, I don't have a lot of money. And then what you are doing is you're adjusting your price. So have in your mind the type of customer you want to work with, the type of budget that you think is fair for the value that you generate for them and manifest that into reality. Manifest it. Okay. Through thought. Through, through action speaking out loud yes <laughs> you know so once you get there okay so let's say once you have your avatar yes. okay and you have a certain limit so this is your ideal customer mm -hmm. how are you going to attract their attention okay it's not as hard as we think let's just say you're um you're a designer a multifaceted designer and you want to work with luxury boutique hotels and resorts all over the world. Once you understand who they are, how they make decisions, where they congregate, where they get their news and information from, you'll start to understand a lot about them, what their pain points are, their challenges, their wants, their needs, their desires, and their belief systems. And now I understand that world a little bit. I want to adopt the language, both words and images that would be attractive to them. From it's their website? Like, pardon me? the language you would get from their website or from well where? okay um let, let me see how i can describe this to you um i think there's this thing called the rob report are you familiar with it the rob report no or like luxury magazine or lux 
So there are certain magazines mm -hmm. that are produced for high net worth individuals and sometimes ultra high net worth individuals. And so when you start to thumb through there, you see the lifestyle of the rich and famous, right? And take this example and then pare it down to wherever you want because you don't always want to work with rich people because they can be annoying too. You can see <laughs> the kinds of cars they drive, the suits they wear, the dresses and the locations and the textures and the materials. You get a sense and you're educating your palate so if you want to be like them and attract them, you have to give them things that are attractive to them. Look at the typefaces they use. Look at how much open space there is, how much blue, green, and gold that's used in the design. And so when you look at your website and it's like rustic reclaimed timber and it's got like hand-drawn letter forms, there is a potential mismatch there unless somebody's looking to build a rustic boutique luxury hotel. So you need to learn their language because this is what's going to pull them in. The next thing that you have to do is probably easy in principle, difficult in execution is you have to start to write. You have to create content. You have to be able to articulate um, your intellectual property, your ideas about things that can help solve some of their pain points. When you do that and it's done in the language and the visual language that they're accustomed to, and you deliver it to them in a place in which they're congregating, your probabilities of being seen and noticed by them go up exponentially. So we want to be very targeted with our marketing. Now, if I may, uh, because I'm going to do this because I love fishing, okay, is when I learned how to fish, and I've been fishing all of my life, not doing a lot of catching, just a lot of fishing. I used to think if you put some kind of bait on a hook, and you throw it in the lake, the river, or the ocean, you'll catch something. And sometimes you do, but what you catch depends a lot on the bait and the depth in which you fish at. So when I was growing up, my uncle wow. would say, you know, put a sinker on this, a weight, throw it out there and wait. But you know what you get? You get bottom feeders, quite literally. You get catfish, you get carp, you get shark if you're fishing in the ocean, or sometimes they're called dogfish, like really spiky, worthless fish with really sharp teeth that are paying to get off the hook you might get halibut or flounder. They're all bottom feeders. So when I learned how to fish for salmon, a prized fish for its nutrients and also for its sportiness in terms of like how it fights, I learned something really important. Salmon swim at a certain depth from the, from the top. And anything that's below them, they don't see. Their eyes are aimed towards the top. They're always looking to the top. And so understanding that means that you have to put yourself in front of the fish where they're at, at a depth that is close to their face without going below them. And you present to them something that they would be attracted to. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but I went to fishing school and I learned this. What salmon, a lot of fish are interested in, are injured fish because it's an easy kill, right? Huh. So if you have a fish that swims like every other fish, they think, oh, uh, it's not worth the, the energy I'm going to expend to catch this fish. So if you are able to move their bait fish in front of them in a way that looks like this and looks injured, it's saying, I would prefer you. Now you're thinking, we didn't tune in to learn how to fish, Chris. What does this have to do with marketing and sales? Everything. You want to create something that looks like an easy win, easy to consume thing for your client. They don't want to work that hard. So if you're trying to attract your ideal client, don't make them watch an hour-long webinar. Their time is too valuable for that. Don't make them go through a four-email sequence before you even tell them what the offer is. They will shut that thing down. Give them something that's bite-sized, relative to them, that's easy to consume, that makes them want more. The other thing that you learn in fishing is you don't pull the hook too fast. You literally will pull the hook out of their mouth and you have no fish. So when they start to uh, hit the bait fish, it will trigger a reaction from you. Be patient. Let the fish take in your hook. It will hook itself. Mm. So you can draw the parallels there. Absolutely. Another thing I think that hinders people when it comes to pricing is mindset and confidence. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's get let's get to our our inner work. Right. So a lot of those you just shared a lot of great tactics and thought processes. And I think it, this ties it a lot to um, Brendan's question as well. How much criticism affected your pricing when you first started? And and, and I, I, if you could tie that to just general 
confidence in ourselves and our feelings of self-worth, how does that factor into pricing? Okay. When it comes to confidence, it has to begin on the inside, not on the outside. So you do have to answer this question. It's a tough question for me to ask you, but I'm going to ask you anyways, is do you believe you're good? Do you believe that the work that you do is unique and interesting and can impact your client's business for the better? Do you have measurable results of this happening in the past? If you have yes to most of these questions, if not all of them, then you should be able to walk into a meeting with the full confidence that the client just needs to realize the value you generate for you to be able to share your gift with them. It's a very different mindset. We're not coming to this less than or needy or desperate or trying to manipulate somebody into getting something that they don't want or need. This is not the act of a person who runs an ethical business. And once you come to that realization, or if you're not quite there yet, the solution to this is to put in many, many hours of practice. You have to be able to be good at your craft to be able to have predictable results. Blair N says this, little vari variation in process equals little variation in outcome. And so when you have a clearly defined process, the outcome is fairly predictable in a good way. And your clients want, want to buy that. You'll notice here, Fanny's been asking me lots of questions like, what are the common mistakes that people make? So if I hadn't talked about this ever, I would be scrambling thinking, uh, um, uh, I don't know. But you can see that when Fanny's asked me a question, not always, obviously, I probably have an answer because I've answered this question 10, 50, 100 times already, which would signal to Fanny, I think he knows what he's talking about because he was able to roll that off so smoothly. So conversely, when clients ask you a question about the website, about the logo, are you able to speak from a platform of confidence having seen the problem many, many times before? And the answer is no. It's probably because you're spread thin pursuing too many different things. You're sometimes a logo designer, illustrator, photographer, architect, interior designer, a juggler, puppet master, animator, compositor. And so you have a lot of experience on many things, but not, I'm sorry, you have a little bit of experience on many things, but not a lot of experience in one thing. So what I would encourage all of you to do is if you want to increase your confidence, think about pressure right? If you apply pressure down with both hands spread out like this, you're not going to create a lot of pressure. But if you take your two hands and you put it together to make a point and you push this way, you can have a breakthrough. So take your interest, wow. consolidate it, and focus that amount of energy so you don't have to work harder. You just need to apply it on a singular focus. And when you do that, you're going to get the kind of clarity and the confidence that you're going to need to have to be able to have a conversation with a client. It begins with confidence. So, uh, if a client criticizes you, your work, that's their prerogative because a lot of what we do is purely subjective. But it's not going to impact your emotional state because you know you've done this before. This client is not able to realize it so you cannot share your gift with them because the only true power you have as a creative person, if any, is to withhold your creative services. That's the only real power. So if you don't like someone, if you don't like the price, you don't like their business, you just don't think they treat people well. You just say the magical word, which is no. Or politely, you could say, no, thank you. Would you still do that if you're just starting out, though? I did that when I started out. Mm. Because here's an idea. How did you get that confidence, though? If okay. you were you just starting know? out and you don't have that. I know I'm coming up to the hour, but here, no, here I want to dive. Let's dive I'll tell you. Okay. The, my inner confidence came from working like an animal. When I was in school, when people were going out to party or sleeping or doing whatever they do in college, I was in the library, I was in the computer lab, I was reading books and I was drawing. You know, I committed myself to a certain lifestyle. And for three years, I kid you not, I lived as a celibate design monk. This is all I did. So I, I swore off relationships and you know, other than visiting my family and having a few conversations. I was just all about this. And I could see the progression that I could make relative to my classmates who started at the exact same time as me. And I was starting to exceed them in terms of my output, the quality of the work, and the confidence I had. So I used that to slingshot out of school saying, you know, I graduated at the top of my class at one of the top design schools in the nation. I think I'm all right. And so I build my success based on that foundational layer 
Um, we talk about homes. That foundational layer is very strong. So I'm not going to let some client come in and say, well, it could be done for less. My response to them, even when I was 20 years old, was I'm sure you could. It's just not going to be me. I take no offense. You have a right to hire whoever you want for whatever price you can get it for. And it's your prerogative to get it for the lowest amount of money possible. It's also my prerogative to align myself with clients who see the value in what I do and the uniqueness of what I offer. And it sounds like we're not a good fit. Period. Period. <laughs> Last question, because okay. we're coming... I, I could talk to you for hours. And I think the people in the audience want... <laughs> to, I, don't, I haven't even gotten to all their questions, but there is a very important thing that you talk about in one of your podcasts. By the way, please tell people where to find your podcast and what it's called, because all of you need to be listening to it. Thank you, Fanny. Quick shout out to your podcast, please. Yes. If you type the future podcast, you'll find it wherever you get your podcast from. It's that simple. The future spelt without any F-U-T-U-R. You talk about burnout and you talk about designing your life, designing your work to work for you. Okay. I, want, I listened to this podcast of yours where you did this whole role play deep dive with, I think, one of your students named Mo, or was it one of yeah, your career employees? Mm -hmm. And you talked all about designing your work, right? So that it works for you and serves for you. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think many of us are worried about making a living and not making a life. Now, being a former Catholic, I have come to this uh, understanding that I have a very short amount of time in, on earth before my before I expire, before I pass on. And I, I don't necessarily believe in second chances or an afterlife. And so I, I need to make the most of what it is that we have. And so I think life is too short for us to do something and live the life that someone else wanted for, for us, uh, for us not to pursue the things that give us joy, that make our hearts sing, and the things that compel us, that draw us out of bed every single day. And this is really important. So we design things for clients all the time, but very rarely do we stop and say, what kind of life do I want to have? What kind of relationship do I want to have? Uh, what kind of contribution or impact do I want to have? And sit down and say, of the options available to me now or in the near future, how do I move in that direction where those things are aligned? And so here's the crazy thing. And I say this, like when I'm on stage and I'm speaking, I say, you know, I, you know, uh, you may want to argue with me, but I believe I have the best job in the world. I get to help people achieve their goals and their dreams. And I get paid handsomely to do that. If you have a better job, let me know about it because I want to learn. And so I've aligned my life now to help others. And there's a funny thing that happens when you try to help other people. You become more valuable. The only reason why I'm speaking to you now, Fanny, or why I'm able to be a keynote speaker at many prestigious conf conferences is because they've seen the videos that we've produced. And they probably would not have seen those videos if other people hadn't seen them. And they're like, why does this video have a million views? Why does this video have 8 million views or whatever it's going to be? There's something that's going on and I need to check this thing out. So that social proof validated by thousands, hundreds of thousands, and sometimes millions of people bring greater importance and focus to the things that I do and say. And because of that, opportunities are created. I love this Zig Ziglar quote. He says that, you can get everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want in life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I get to do. So if you're sitting there working nine to five, living for the weekends, hating the week, it's a clear signal you're not doing what it was meant for you to do. So are you saying the bigger the value we put out, the more we can attract and charge more? And hence, I, we I can say it simpler less. than that. Yeah. If you want to get more, give more. Mm. That's it. Start with giving. Give generously. Give abundantly. Give without strings or expectations. Give without attachment. Wonderful things will happen to you. And then when they come, you charge them <laughs> for their value, for the value you're creating. You want to hear something crazy, Fanny? I'll just tell you right now. You Please. won't even have to charge them. They'll voluntarily give you the money. Mm. Um, okay. Let's put things in context, okay? Like, what is a decent salary to make in America in a year? What do you think that number is? Not 
not the West Coast or the East Coast, the big cities, but America. Like when you were growing up, did you ask yourself, like, if I made this amount of money as a salaried employee, I will feel like I've made it. Do you know what that number is, Fanny? I can only speak for myself. Of course. It would be making $100,000. I love that answer. You know why? Because it's the same answer I have. Okay. I remember when I was 16 um, and my brother's 40 years older than me, so he's 20. His name is Arthur. And I said, Arthur, you know, what do you have to make it make in America to feel like you've made it? And he said, kiddo, if you made $100,000 a year, you're going to be doing all right. And I was mm -hmm. fixated on a number. Now, that's a long time ago. So just for you hit that, that probably, long time ago, <laughs> you, you know, that'd be like a really high number now, relatively speaking, adjusted for inflation. And I think about this. Right. So in a year, if you make a hundred thousand dollars, I mean, people who are listening to this right now, if you're not making a hundred thousand dollars, ask yourself, would you be happy making a hundred thousand dollars a year? And especially if you don't live in America, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money where in some countries it's five thousand dollars a year is a decent salary. OK, now I say this in context, because what I've been doing in the last eight years is creating content, helping to lift other people up. People now pay me between 90 to $130,000 to do a couple of social media posts, which takes me all of two and a half hours to do. And I put that out there for you to understand this idea that if you give more, you will get more and you won't even have to ask for it. It's not even negotiation because people come to you and they say, I love what you do. I love your mission. I love how you're connected to your community, how genuine you are, how open and transparent you are. We want to work with people just like you. Would you consider doing this for $90,000? Yeah, I would. What are we talking about, friend? And then we do business. That's how it works. So on that note, that aspiration for all of us to earn $90,000 for two hours of work. <laughs> Oh, not that it's about the time, but it's about the value. Um, may we all dream bigger and aim higher. Right, Chris? Followed by an awful amount of consistent hard work. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, our time is up. And there's people in the comments blowing up. They're, they're going to have a party, a popcorn party to watch the replay of all this and all your videos because there's just so much value in what you're saying i i'm gonna have to go back and re-watch it um thank you chris thank you so much for giving of your time and your valuable valuable time i know from all the messages that um everybody derived huge huge value from it so i i just have so much gratitude for that thank you Thank you very much, Fanny. And I want to say this in a very genuine way. It is absolutely my pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. I want to bring back real quick. Um, if if you need to go, oh, then I, 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 I wasn't sure. You're what good. We're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, good for a bit. I'm just going to give away a prize because oh, we're going to thank the, prize, the audience, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm going to bring on Anne Small real quick. Um, Anne, I couldn't keep up with all the comments. <laughs> I know. What would we do without Rebecca helping me? My goodness. Right. Um, there were a lot of comments and especially, I mean, there's just a lot of comments and we are going to have watch parties, Chris. We're going to put your video on, get together and brainstorm together. So anywhere we can soak this up, but okay. Today's winner, it was very witty. So there was a lot of comments and we all need to go back and watch this again, but it was very witty. So Chris Doe, he uses his last name on so many things like the book. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing the first name right. It's N-G-H-I-A. Nigia, I don't know how you would say it, but his last name is Ho. And he says, um, oh my goodness, what would Chris do if he had my last name? <laughs> 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 and I thought out of all the serious stuff today that people were aspiring to, that that really just kind of broke it up. And he was so right, like, the branding is perfect. He used his last name. The branding is who he is. He's living it. If his awesome. last name was Ho, it might be a problem. It might be, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yes. I so <laughs> I can recognize his name. He must be Vietnamese, a brother from another mother. 
So it's Nia Ho. And I, I don't know what to do with it because that's your problem to solve. But I got to tell you something. <laughs> Growing up in America, you know, in the uh, 70s and 80s, having the name Doe was not an easy name to live with. It was the yeah. source of uh, jokes and the the butt of many uh, comments that Try came Fanny. my way. <laughs> right? So it's tough. We all have a tough Fanny. name. And I think when we come to not only uh, um, deal with, but embrace our name, our identity, our culture as a thing to celebrate, I think we have arrived. Mm. So until then, keep working on it. Beautifully said. So please reach out to Anne, the winner. You are getting a lapel mic. I'll be sure to send that off to you. Um, so s pronounce that name again, Chris. Get it's Nia. 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 Oh. <laughs> you can't say it. You have to swallow your tongue to say it if you're not Vietnamese. So don't worry about it. He's very excited about it. He's running woo and yeah, and he's very happy. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Um, real quick before we wrap up, if you just stay right there, give me one second while I announce a few upcoming shows here. Um, for all of you out there, April 26th that are in technology, we have a technology happy hour, April 26th. Register at abtpdfw.org. And for those of you that are in SAP, I'm going to be at the Sapphire Conference, May 10th to 12th. So be sure to visit with me. Let me know if you're going. And on May 18th, the CG Hour with Cyber Group. We're going to talk all around innovation and technology. And May 19th, we have Chris Duffy, video manager from Restream. We're going to talk all about the future of social media. She's going to be my guest on the live show. And on June 2nd, Lanair Johnston and Michelle Raymond, we're going to talk all about LinkedIn company pages. So be sure to subscribe, save, connect with me on LinkedIn or be a subscriber on YouTube. Connect with Chris and follow him on all his channels. Chris, any final words before we close out? Um, my final words is I just want to give a quick shout out to some of the people who tuned in live. Uh, David, uh, Jenny, Nyo, who we mentioned many times, Rebecca, all of you, uh, uh, Renike, uh, Jennifer, Farhana, thank you very much for tuning in and thanks for being a part of this amazing community. Fanny and Anne, thank you so much. Be well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you and for all of you out there, continue to shine your light, share your message, share your gifts with the world. And I hope you'll do it through video.